Sunday. Not just any Sunday, but the first Sunday we have been lucid in 2023. And the cannabis triumphate is back. <laughs> and it's now time to jump into the rotation. Wow, a new year, new equipment, a new attitude, <laughs> and the same old shit going on in Washington, D.C. <laughs> that is that is pretty much how we, we got this whole year started, and that, that's fine. We, we, we know exactly what our goals are. Well, let's start off by saying who we are. I am your host, uh, well, one of our th three hosts anyway, which I am now officially calling the Cannabis Triumphate, because that, that just works out just fine. I am the political director of Suncoast Normal, Gary Stein, and also the master of public health. To my right, <laughs> there's, there's my timing. To, to my right, your left, is Carlos Hermida. Uh, what's else? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't going to let you interrupt me on there. Our deputy director and master of business Bid me. administration and resident atheist. And to our right, uh, and your right, our executive director, coming to us from above the beltway, where he hits him below the beltway, Christopher Kano. All Chris, right. How, how, how are things going? Can, can you smell, could, could you smell um, <coughs> McCarthy's fear over there? I, I can tell you this much. There were definitely some late night smoke breaks in the Capitol over the past week in the fight for the speakership. And uh, well, you know, luckily in D.C., it's uh, it's been uh, decriminalized and uh, semi legalized for uh, uh, adult use purposes. I got to admit, it, it, it was fun political theater for an entire week. We watched Congress get absolutely nothing done. And it was riveting, <laughs> which is bizarre in and of itself. Watch Matt Gates do some start some problems. Well, Matt Gates has has established himself as a power player who was willing to manipulate practically the entire Congress to get front and center on on Fox on Sunday mornings. Mm -hmm. Matt Gates is also the same guy who Venmo's his buddy for underage girls and titles it "pussy" on the Venmo. So I mean, you know, it is what it is. Well, at least he's accurate with his uh, uh, documentation. I think, which is really important. I mean, for tax purposes, I mean, it makes sense. You want to know what all that shit's allocated for. Well, people no, no, Matt Gates is the type of friend <laughs> that you would you would give an eighth to, and he'd be dumb enough to Venmo you back the money, put weed for it. Like, the goddamn <laughs> government doesn't monitor everything you do on your cell phone. Let's not forget that um, Matt Gates represents uh, Congressional District 1 here in Florida, which is the left-hand tip... <laughs> of the Panhandle, and of course the center of Pensacola, otherwise known as Lower Alabama. Mm, so just and, the tip uh, of Florida. When they say just the tip, they mean just Matt Gates. The, just the tip. <laughs> and when, when, you, when you want just the tip, you want Matt Gates. <laughs> good, good work. Good work. There you go. No, but he had total control of the thing, but I knew darn well that Matt Gates would never let it get to 18. He never lets it get to 18. <laughs> so let, let that think on, uh, sink on you for a minute. But no, it, that has to do with the age of yeah, the that girls kind of, that he has sex with. Well, but, but let's not forget, though, again. I didn't take no time I, to see I, I can't help but to say that <laughs> if, if it weren't for Matt, I probably wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be here because he actually had, had the gumption or motivation in one form or another to get this program started in, in Tallahassee. Oh, shit. Before, he, and there were other people who put bills out before him that never even got to committee. Hmm. But while, while he was- hey, You're talking about the CBD law that like- in ran, Yeah, that, that, that really officially came out much, as, as, as but yeah, truly leave in charge, eh? No. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> Carlos with the zinger. So, so I, I, I appreciate that. I know, I know you helped him out with, with uh, that bill, Gary. I, I think he actually kind of like took advantage of your good name, I think. But um, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest with you, but- but I had to wash it twice after that. I, I have to I have to say, I don't think that bill did anything. I don't even think that bill actually distributed cannabis. It did not, <laughs> so to speak, any more than the cannabis seed will get you high if you chunk on it. You know? Yeah. 
Mm. That, that's just the way it is. Sometimes I mean, you have to plant the seed. The seed is not the plant. The seed is just the beginning. And hopefully we can we, we can go beyond that uh, husk and, and and find something, something beautiful in what we are have right now. We need a glitch, Bill, and we are going to have to dive headlong into the politics of the whole thing as we as we move forward. Gary, you sound like a prosperity gospel preacher. You just got to plant that seed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need your seed money. <laughs> I mean, we are coming from a, a standpoint of true altruism to our own de uh, deficit, I think, here in, in Normal. We don't work for money. We, we are a volunteer-only basis right now. But we do need money to run the show. And so since we have a excellent guest coming on that I don't want to interrupt. Let's let's go ahead and, and throw the commercial on front here and just say that first off, we want you to become a, a member of Suncoast Normal this year. In 2023, let's make it the year of your membership where we are going to move forward and get these glitches fixed. They've been there since we, uh, 2017 Bill made this whole program re, uh, the way it is right now. And in order to do that, you have to go to suncoastnormal.org as you see on the bottom of the screen on the crawl. And, and you can go ahead and put in your, uh, excuse me, information. That's, sorry about that. That's a coffee con leche burst. <laughs> that just means you didn't put enough leche in there, Gary. You still got to cut that acid. That, that, was, that double espresso will get you every time, buddy. It wasn't the leche. It was uh, some kind of additive. <laughs> <laughs> but... But along with your membership, of course, you get this fantastic membership pin, which really freaks out the people over at Publix, and also lets everybody know exactly <laughs> where you stand on policy. And of course, you get <clears throat> free access to events. You get a discount here at Chillum. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five percent off. And you can be part of something bigger than yourself. So come on down and join that. And don't forget, also, we have a Patreon account. We need to get this thing uh, continuing to going. We don't want to take money from big corporation, although we will. And uh, we, we want to get more of this at, this to you. So become a sponsor or talk to these guys about that kind of thing because they are the, biz they are the business. Now, I should also mention that in, in this, our Cannabis Triumphate, Chris is our official master of business administration. No, that's, that's Carlos. That's Carlos. I'm sorry, yeah. Public administration. <laughs> Indeed, public administration. Yeah, there's, there's so much difference there, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, Carlos was taught how to make billions of dollars in college, and I was taught how to spend other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> always use OPM. Always, always, always use OPM because you know, it's no problem if you lose theirs, right? You, and, uh, then, then you can become like that guy over with the uh, with, with the cryptocurrency. Always use somebody else's money. But we we we, we digress. But we, we are starting a brand new year here where we're going to get some diversity of topics. Yeah, we get into politics all the time because, face it, politics got us into this mess and politics will get us out of it. But yeah. we need to go ahead and fix policy and more than anything else in, in this thing. And there have been people who've been working at this from the very beginning. And as part of our series of what did you do since 72, we have today Dr. Ethan uh, Nittleman, coming to you from the great state of New York. Am I, am I correct? You are you are on the on the uh, island of Long Island. Is that correct? Or are you in Manhattan? I'm on the island of Manhattan, Gary. All right. Well, uh, take your your greatest papaya hot dog, put it aside, and, and light up one because we're going to have a great conversation. Sounds good. Welcome, welcome, Doc. Glad to have you. Yeah, nice to be on. How you doing? Oh. Uh, Fantastic. We we are just starting out a brand new year here in the beautiful Chillum uh, Cannabis and Mushroom. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. Shroom and CBD Gallery because we have to keep it right for the legal folks. Out there. <laughs> How are you doing, officer? Yeah, we're, 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 we're keeping the, the line here. Chillum now. Mushroom and Hemp Dispensary. Yes. There you go. Nationally known, too, because he's got national coverage of being the first brick and mortar on this side of the, the country to actually sell the mushrooms in the store. Uh, uh, well, market it the way that I do. Uh, so people have been selling Amanita muscaria for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. But they, they said that you're the only one who's doing it legally. Um, well, uh, according to the Department of Agriculture, um, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, the problem we we actually don't have Amanita Muscaria in house right now, um, and we're working on developing a new business called Lang Euphoria, because I was selling Amanita Muscaria to consume. Because if you consume it, it'll make you trip, and it'll make you, you can, and if you consume it, you can microdose with it. So uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, came in here and said, no more. Uh, you can't eat this. This is not approved by the FDA. As a matter of fact, they came in and said that it was poisonous. Um, so, uh, you know, we're not fighting it. We're going to uh, form another business called Learn Euphoria, and we're going to sell this mushroom for educational and spiritual purposes. I dig that. I dig that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Carlos, before uh, cannabis became Schedule One. Uh, one of this, the casualties of the war on drugs uh, was studies around mushrooms and psilocybin. Um, you know, in Bethesda, the National Institute of Health, uh, they were doing studies in the 60s around uh, providing, you know, end of life uh, care to cancer patients who were terminally ill and, and giving them mushrooms and such and seeing the different outcomes and how people meet death in a much more peaceful and, and welcoming manner. And you know that was just one of those casualties that uh, they haven't picked those studies back up until in the last couple of years. And so the Nixon administration really did do a number uh, on uh, on delaying research into that. And what we're seeing is uh, that mushrooms can help with uh, depression, and, uh, among another other things. But I'm not the expert on that. Uh, Dr. Nettleman is. So, uh, Ethan, if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, uh, maybe what your experience is and, and what you see is the value of, uh, you know, psychedelics and, and psilocybin in addition to cannabis uh, as part of a, a new th modern therapy regimen for folks. Well, I mean, Dan, uh, <laughs> I, I would it's say, an all question I, there. I, 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 no, I, I mean, I really think, I mean, it, with 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 the psychedelics, and when you look at psilocybin, or for that matter, ayahuasca, mescaline, the whole range of those. I mean, uh, it just seems that their potential is really extraordinary. And of course, you know, they're not risk free. I mean, people have had harmful things happen to them. People have done stupid things and died. Uh, people who have some types of mental illness obviously should not be playing around with this stuff. and They should not be doing it in reckless situations. But I have to say, I mean, two things. First of all, um, when you look at all the scientific evidence that's come out, you know, all right. There was a huge amount of scientific research being done back in the late 50s and the 60s, right? I mean, really finding there's a, one of my first introductions was a book by Lester Grinspoon and James Bacalar called Psychology Drugs Reconsidered. It was a book written in, uh, I think, the 70s or 80s. That was a fantastic overview about, about psychedelics and re, you know, reported on the hundreds of studies that showed their benefits in dealing with the same sorts of things that we're seeing studies prove now or demonstrate now, which is dealing with addiction, dealing with depression, dealing with end of life, dealing with uh, PTSD, a whole range of those things. And so this new psychedelic renaissance that's going on right now, you know, supported by you know, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of private funding. Unfortunately, the government's not been, you know, very keen on funding this stuff as yet, although that may be changing a bit. But you're seeing, you know, one study after another coming out showing real substantial potential to help people and to potentially revolutionize the whole field of psychiatry in dealing with types of mental illness and mental difficulties that, um, you know, where, where the basic prescription drugs help some people somewhat, but mostly don't help a lot of people much at all. And so I think that's incredible. I think that separately from that, you know, there's just kind of the personal stuff. I mean, I've never done it or almost never done it in a kind of traditional psychotherapeutic context. But in my own personal life, my own use of, of uh, psychology, especially psilocybin, but other ones as well, it's really, it's had a profound effect on my life, I think. I mean, I think part of the reason I landed up committing my life to working to end the war on drugs for many decades and building the organization and movement that I was involved in was, you know, shaped in part by powerful experience, especially with mushrooms. I could say some of my most important intellectual insights, spiritual insights, uh, you know, my most amazing culinary experience, my most amazing orgasm. I mean, all of these things happened not at the peak of a psychedelic experience, but sort of after I peaked and with kind of those hours as you're coming down. And so you have all of that. And then you have the fact that these things have been integrated into all types of religious 
ceremony, religious tradition, whether you're looking at peyote with the Native American church, whether you're looking at the way that uh, the Buiti in Gabon in West Africa use iboga, you know, the source of ibogaine, whether you're looking at ayahuasca and its role both in, you know, Brazilian churches like Santo Daime or UDV or a whole range of others. And then the more you look, the more deeply you look, the more you see that all sort of these substances have a very substantial history, especially in the Americas, but sometimes in other parts of the world as well. So I think that although there are some risks associated with this new psychedelic renaissance, and although it's inevitable that some people will get hurt, and sadly, even a few people may die, I think the benefits in terms of people's spiritual and intellectual and emotional psychological awakening and in terms of therapeutic elements is just going to be enormous. So I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what's going on now and I'm thoroughly enjoying following all of this and going to speak and, and observe at some of these psychedelic events. And I think it's going to keep going for quite a while. I don't think this stuff's going to, I don't think it's going to be overturned the way that things happened in the late 60s, early 70s when Richard Nixon took advantage of Timothy Leary's kind of buoyant excesses and really uh you know shut down the whole thing i don't i don't see that happening i think if anything this is going to become an increasingly global movement i mean at least timothy leary actually gave us an accurate interpretation of what was going on as opposed to dr munch who uh when he was when they were working on cannabis law back in the 1930s discussed his own experience of having taken cannabis and uh, turned into a, a bat flown around the room and uh, I guess fell into a vat of ink and then woke up. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I don't think that was quite accurate, but that was actually used as the basis for, for a number of the, of the earlier rules and laws. And of course, that actually led to a, an interesting side effect is when they, of course, made it illegal, then when people, people could start using mens rea as a, a math, as a, a uh, defense at that point in time. If you killed somebody, well, if you were high on cannabis, then it's, it was excusable at that point. I, I, I mean, I, I never, I, I'll tell you, I never heard of people successfully making that defense. I mean, you know, there was the famous Twinkie defense, right? You know, from 30, 40 years ago in San Francisco, when a member of the city council murdered the mayor Moscone and the gay rights activist Harvey Milk, who was on the board of supervisors, and Dan White, I think his name was, and he used the Twinkie defense, right? That the Twinkies had caused him to lose control of his behavior, and therefore that should be a defense for having killed people. And he, and he kind of got away with a little bit of it. But, you know, my view, although, you know, my politics have generally been sort of, you know, progressive, and I believe fundamentally that nobody should be punished for what they put in their bodies. On the other hand, as long as they don't hurt anybody else, on the other hand, the notion that somebody should be able to say, because I got drunk, because I got high, because I did psychedelics, because whatever, that explains the behavior I engaged in that hurt other people. I mean, my view is a judge in sentencing somebody may take into account the fact that their behavior was influenced by an addiction or drug use, but it cannot absolve them of personal responsibility for their actions. And so you, you need to retain that element of personal responsibility in, in all of this. I think that's pivotal in any civilized society. Now, right across the street from us is a building that has the word Lakata over the top of it. And that, that's kind of uh, <clears throat> influential in the whole cannabis world because uh, Victor Lakata was a young man who who was bipolar, although they called it uh, uh, pre, uh, pre uh, precoxia. Uh, anyways, mm. they, they said that, that he was dementia precoxia. That's that's it. That's what they, that's what they called it at the time because of the fact that he and his and his brother and his uncle all had that same thing when they turned eighteen. They suddenly went absolutely bonkers, and his dad was giving him cannabis to try to keep him grounded. There was a shortage, and then all of a sudden. Uh, he killed his entire family with an axe. And of course, uh, <clears throat> Anslinger just kind of grabbed that, made it as part of his gore files. In fact, the one that he took to the, to the UN to create that, that, uh, the, the, uh, the law that is today. And it's all, all about it was that he became violent because of cannabis. And so it was actually flipped on its axis at that point in time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you look back, uh, Gary, you know, at this history with Anslinger. I mean, the first thing to keep in mind, of course, was that if you look deeply at it, what you see is that the history of cannabis prohibition, it didn't start in the U.S., did not start with Anslinger, right? It really began at the state, the local and state level. It was in the Southwest and the Western states where it was heavily linked with Mexican migrants and Mexican-Americans. I think El Paso had the first anti-cannabis ordinance back in 1913. 
Spain, and then it spread throughout the West and Southwest, and then separately in the Northeast. And there's kind of a new histo historiography emerging about all of this. Um, uh, you know, you had basically it being identified with other sorts of deviants, not with Mexicans, but others, and, and resulting in criminalization in the Northeast. And Anslinger initially, I mean, remember, Harry Anslinger, you know, cut his teeth initially in the early, late 20s, early 30s, as or late 20s, as head of the foreign control section of the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol Prohibition. It was his job to try to work with other states to encourage them to support U.S. alcohol prohibition. And then in 1930, as the Federal Bureau of Narcotics is being created, he's appointed to become the new head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, a job he has for the next 32 years and really plays the pivotal role in the middle of the 20th century in sort of pushing both U.S. and global drug prohibitionist policies. But initially, he's focused on opiates and he kind of dismisses the cannabis thing. And then as he sees, you know, basically the excitement in local media around marijuana and around the sensationalism, that's when he kind of jumps on board someplace in the mid 30s. So you already have a network of state marijuana prohibition laws in the teens and 20s and, and, and the early 30s. And then Anslinger is the one who drives forward the Federal Bureau, the, uh, the, 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 the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, using this lurid imagery, you know, the stuff we associate with the film uh, Reefer Madness. I mean, all of this absolute craziness and playing on the worst and most venal prejudices. So he was a really, I think, a per, he did a profound amount of evil. And, and he was, as you know, because he was internationally oriented, he played a big role in proselytizing, uh, you know, drug prohibition, including cannabis prohibition around to the rest of the world. We weren't the only country. I mean, you look at the history of international drug prohibition and even on cannabis prohibition. You saw, for example, Egypt, for example, plays some role in pushing cannabis prohibition. There were other countries that had this, but other places didn't even know what cannabis was. And as a result of pressure from the U.S. and the League of Nations, they would sign on to a prohibition of cannabis, you know, without not, not even knowing what it was. And then 40 years later, all of a sudden, it's a big illicit market, and they're dealing with the consequences of having prohibited it decades before for absolutely no good reason, just as a result of you know international pressures and kind of going along. So it is a complex history. By the way, there's a great book called by a guy named Isaac Campos, C-A-M-P-O-S. I'm just looking on my shelf here. Um, but he's it's a professor from the University of Cincinnati. That's right. And he's done a really interesting Damn, Barry, tape about the criminalization of marijuana. So I, I strongly encourage your listeners to check it out. Isaac Campos, C-A-M-P-O-S. Uh, yeah. 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 That's a book that where, where it shows the peasant being killed by uh, the serpent and the, and the, uh, the, the eagle. I, I brought the book over to you. I'll show you that one time but in, in regards to uh, the history of, of Mexican cannabis law. Mexican. Yeah, that's oh, right. He, he, are you doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 there was actually a lot of religion mixed in there too. The, the Catholicism that had been brought throughout Mexico, where they, people would start, you know, genuflecting whenever they saw anybody any cannabis, and other people would say, "All right, you keep on genuflecting. Can I have that uh, joint, please?" <laughs> well, there's always the role of the church. Traditional churches, generally speaking, in trying to suppress and demonize these substances. Uh, I mean, you look, you know, for example, even with respect to coca. In Latin America, you know, the source of cocaine, but when chewed in the form of the coca leaf is essentially harmless and to some extent even beneficial. <laughs> um, or if you look, for example, at the use of some of the psychedelics in um, in some of the more, you know, pre-European societies, it's when the Europeans show up and oftentimes the Catholic Church that you see the real demonization of these things and the suppression. Wow. Um, it's it's yeah. almost like there's like organized religion is kind of against the whole psychedelic thing, but like spirituality is more because there's always like a, a spiritual context, like yeah. even with with Catholicism, even in, with Maria Sabina, the 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 whole mushroom thing was about God, and everything, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Although, you know, it's not all, I mean, I always make this distinction. It's not so much about organized religion because you have liberal versions of most organized religions of, of, of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hindu, whatever. It's really the more fundamentalist versions that are resistant to this stuff because you sometimes can oftentimes see in the more progressive elements of established religion, um, also Jewish, Islam, Christianity, you know, you'll see much more openness on the use of these substances, people appreciating the spiritual benefits, the old, look, to some extent, you know, if you look at, say, the UDV or the or the Santo Dime churches in Brazil, these are basically Catholic 
I think Catholic, you know, where they regard the uh, ayahuasca as a sacred sacrament and where they see this as a means of opening up people's hearts to Jesus and people who have been traumatized in life and feel a spiritual emptiness. You know, I, I've actually been at one of these ceremonies where, where, you know, people go through the powerful ayahuasca experience and, and then they feel open at the end of it. And then the person leading the ceremony says, let Jesus into this empty place there. I mean, think about also the fact if you look at Alcoholics Anonymous, right, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill W., right? I mean, two very powerful things related to psychedelics. And one of these I only learned recently. The first was that some of the insight that Bill W., that Bill W.'s initial insight for creating uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was actually came from a very powerful experience with Belladonna which is a somewhat dangerous psychedelic substance where people have actually sometimes died from consuming it. But he used that and that provided a pivotal insight to it. And then decades later, when Alcoholics Anonymous is well established, Bill W. uses, I think it was, I can't remember if it was LSD or mescaline, maybe LSD. And, and he finds it helpful in dealing with his intractable depression. And he starts speaking publicly about this and the benefits of, of, of psychedelics and helping people struggling with addiction to become more spiritually aware, to get to that place where things can click and they can move on without the use of alcohol in the past. And he's persuaded by other leaders of AA to, AA to shut up. But if you look at all the major biographies of Bill W., that story is clearly in there. So, you know, and that was had a very clearly, even if they talked about the higher power, so they gave people who did not believe in, quote unquote, a traditional God, an option of, of having a higher power. It still was, a, in many respects, a traditional religious um, belief system that ultimately, of course, the organization itself rejected the psychedelics. But Bill W., you know, as the founder, I think, you know, played an important role in that. And, and the fact that he was open to this, I think, is resulting in a growing discussion in the recovery community, as I'm hearing from people in that community, that even though they remain quite doctrinaire, that if you've had a problem with one drug, say alcohol, you should never use any other psychoactive drug, there's a growing awareness that maybe the psychedelics are special, that they're different, that because it's almost impossible to get addicted to these substances, because they have these obvious therapeutic difference, uh, you know, uh, benefits that let's not treat it the same as booze or cocaine or, or heroin or even for, to some extent cannabis for some people right so so i know the world's getting interesting and complex in all sorts of fascinating ways from from where i'm sitting i'll tell you that i've always wondered how much science can actually deviate uh religious doctrine or change religious doctrine i mean saint francis of assisi was known to have done a lot of mathematics and things of that sort and tried to change the, the attitudes of the church by saying you can you can actually derive where and who God is through mathematics and through science, and yet other people have said no, we have to stay, you have to deviate away from science to truly truly embrace religion. Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you, Gary, it, it, it's funny. I think about um, to the when you can establish through science the medical benefits of something. I think about these wonderful videos I've seen of like these incredibly orthodox, traditional, conservative rabbis in Israel, you know, the 93 year old, the you know, famous rabbi, whatever, and blessing cannabis because it has a medical benefit to it. Or, you know, on, on my own podcast, Psychoactive, uh, one of my guests. Uh oh. I think we may have. You may have frozen for a moment there. I don't know. Uh, Chris, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. It looks like uh, Dr. Edelman's um, uh, stream froze up. So maybe he can disconnect or reconnect. There we go. All right. Well, we'll be right back uh, with Dr. Ethan Edelman. Um, but Gary, you know, I think, you know, you make a good point in that <laughs> oftentimes the powers that be uh, don't like change. And so when they create a worldview and they run with it and they stick with it for so many years, it is difficult yeah. to change that worldview. And there's so much uh, propaganda that goes into any institution maintaining power to, to keep the worldview intact. And so uh, Dr. Nadelman makes a great point in that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, 
things have to change. And once you see those more conservative elements and fundamentalist elements of, of certain uh, organizations, institutions adopting uh, and embracing this um, because it is a beneficial medicine to folks, then we'll start to actually see some change. And that's really a great metaphor for what we see in the U.S. Congress. Some of the most conservative members of Congress uh, and even some of the most conservative states are embracing cannabis as medicine. And we see that with things like Utah adopting employment protections for medical marijuana patients. But somehow we can't get that done in Florida. And that just irritates me. I got to <laughs> tell you, you know, my, my organization, we were a little bit involved. Can you guys hear me now? I think. I, yeah, I, absolutely. I yeah. Welcome yeah, back. I, we got Welcome involved. Uh, uh, I got cut off on the thing talking about Iran. But the key point there was this author, Maziar Giabi, interviewed many of the Islamic mullahs. And they basically said, if the evidence is there that this is a medicine, then it is not haram. It is not forbidden. It is, you know, halal. It is basically kosher. It is okay under Islamic law. So there is that flexibility and there are these vigorous debates in traditional, you know, established religions about whether or not this stuff could be accepted. And you obviously have the doctrinaire element, which is sometimes linked to, you know, abstinence ideologies. You saw this very powerful in many elements of the more conservative Protestant movement in America, you know, which was very supportive of alcohol prohibition, even though there's no prohibition on alcohol in the Bible, right? I mean, in the Bible, people are drinking wine and wine is, you know, part of the sacrament as such. And it's also being some that's used for pleasure without being condemned. So, you know, pro, you know the, the, the kind of religious Protestant supporters of alcohol prohibition 100 years ago had to kind of jump through hoops to try to explain why alcohol should be prohibited. Um, so it, it, it is very much the case. But I'll tell you, you know, when uh, you mentioned earlier, the uh, 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 Kano mentioned it um, about, uh, about Utah. We, we were involved. I remember I talked to the guy when in my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, we were deeply involved in advancing a lot of the legalization of, of marijuana, both for medical purposes and more broadly. And we got someone involved in Utah and the guy leading the efforts there, his grandfather, I think, had been like royalty in the Mormon world. Right. I mean, I think he had, uh, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, I think he'd actually been in Eisenhower's cabinet. He was one of the most influential ones. So you had influential Mormons saying this stuff is real. And then uh, some time after, he didn't initially reveal that he himself was a medical marijuana patient. But, I mean, you look at Utah, Utah legalized medical marijuana. Uh, you know, people figured out that this, you know, this did not need to be something that was banned. Uh, I don't know if it got a majority of the Mormon vote, but it surely got a substantial Mormon vote. So, you know, this stuff does break through some of the kind of religious ideological prejudices, no matter where you're coming from. And when it comes to the Republicans, you know, and Democrats, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, I've been involved in this, you know, uh, in, I mean, since we really, you know, played a pivotal role in the first seven medical marijuana initiatives, first in California in 96, and then in Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, and Maine in 98 through 2000, you know, most of our support was typically coming from Democrats, progressives, um, you know, it was always higher there and lower among Republicans, et cetera. But that has definitely evolved over time. And sometimes we had Republican leaders like Gary Johnson who was the Republican governor of New Mexico in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, who became a good friend and ally and, and was passionate about this and had other strong support among Republicans there. So, you know, it's kind of interesting now when you look in um, the Congress and you see a guy like Matt Goetz, who, you know, I just have utter contempt for in terms of what he's doing to the nation. But, you know, it's interesting to see him being on the same side as AOC when it comes to drug policy, at least on cannabis policy. Right. Yeah. And there's a few others like that. Nancy Mace, who I had as a guest on my podcast. I mean, you know, she's a more moderate Republican in the current context. But you see some interesting support um, coming from those, you know, those corners. You look at South Dakota, which two years ago voted to legalize marijuana, although the most they, they did it over after the Republican governor, uh, Christy Noem, undermined it. And they didn't get it through the second time. But still, that's a major, substantial majority Republican state. You look in Mississippi where a wonderful Republican legislator really led the effort to legalize medical marijuana. I mean, you look at Missouri, essentially a red state now. You look at Arkansas. I mean, medical marijuana is moving forward very quickly. And I think we're getting to the point where we're going to see broader legalization, even in the red states. And that's going to be driven in part by younger Republicans, because younger Republicans, unlike the older Republicans, are very supportive of cannabis reform and sometimes of even other areas of drug policy reform. And to switch back to mushroom stuff, look at former Governor Rick Perry, 
right? The former Republican governor of Texas, who then was in Trump's cabinet, you know, played a very important role in Texas passing one of the most progressive laws on, on research into the value of psychedelics and dealing with PTSD and such. So, you know, it, it, this is a fascinating issue of crossover where a lot of the momentum is coming more from the Democratic progressive side. But where there's growing support on the more Republican conservative side in ways that are really, you know, making history and making the United States a global leader in this area. Well, we here in Florida are, are always very conflicted about uh, Representative Gates, in part because he helped sponsor the bill which became SB 1030, which was the beginning of our compassionate cannabis law, which allowed us to have low THC and was basically the seed for the entire industry. But the question was, what was his ultimate agenda? Was it to help? Uh, save all the, uh, the Charlotte Wiggies of the world, or was it to uh, eventually create a mega industry that will bring in mega bucks? And, and of course, lobbyists and special interests tend to have a bit of a heavy hand in regards to legislation here in the state of Florida. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I got to tell you, I crossed paths a number of times with John Morgan, who was the initial major, you know, huge Democratic Party donor and also the leader of the medical marijuana legalization efforts. So John and I crossed paths another of t a couple of times and I and I helped with some of the funding and my staff helped with some of the drafting of the medical marijuana initiative in Florida. The first one that got rejected when Shade Sheldon Adelson threw in millions of dollars to defeat it. You know, and in Florida, of course, you guys changed your law a few years ago where you now need 60 percent of the vote to pass a ballot instead of 50 percent. I think the only state in the country where that's true, at least it was. Um, and Adelson was able to take advantage of that so that the first medical marijuana effort, I think, only got 57 percent or something. and didn't quite make it. But John Morgan was you know, wonderfully committed to this, put millions of dollars into the thing. I haven't kept track on what the latest is going on there, um, but it is true. Florida, you guys are... Uh, Different politics in New York, that's for sure. You know, yeah. indeed. I've been working up here in the DMV for the past three years, and just um, you know, between Maryland, Virginia, and DC, it it uh, the the politics is vastly different than Florida. Um, you know, even uh, in Maryland, which is a, a, a triple blue state, uh, it, you know, it's it's interesting to still see that um, you have to work with uh, folks who, you know, like if Democrats control everything. The Republicans have hardly any power in the state of Maryland, but uh, you still got to work with uh, conservative elements within the Democratic Party and corporate elements that, that you know, that have a vested interest in still keeping this illegal. Um, you know, you, you got to think about uh, the private prison industry and how legalization has impacted their bottom line and how much they're going to continue to to fight us, uh, you know, on this. You know, um, in Florida, we always thought it'd be Disney uh, in the Chamber of Commerce that, that continuously fight against this. Um, but we've seen that... Um, Cannabis has made a thriving uh, industry. You know, yeah. lots of jobs are being created. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, it's interesting because people, the private prison industry, I don't know how much the marijuana thing played a big role there. I mean, they were, but they, the private prison corporations would sometimes in their annual statements to shareholders where they had to talk about what are the risks up ahead. And one of the things they would, would reveal is that they that they saw the growing influence of the drug policy and criminal justice reform community and our efforts, you know, successful efforts in rolling back these harsh drug laws, mostly not about marijuana, mostly in other areas, as a significant threat to their financial well-being. But then when some of my liberal allies would all be about, you know, bashing private prisons, which was the right thing to do, but I'd point out that if you went to California, our biggest problem was not the private prison industry, it was the prison guards union. And those were the ones who were basically because they saw, you know, when the prison population had a very substantial percentage of people who were there in there for nonviolent drug offenses, mostly not marijuana, mostly, you know, other stuff. But still, you know, they shouldn't be going to prison. It's really not for long periods of time. You know, the prison industry was our, our the, the, the prison guards union was one of our biggest opponents, even though they were allied with the Democratic Party. Now, the funny thing I'll tell you is when, you know, because, uh, you know, I and my colleagues really, you know, co-led the California legalization effort in 2016. And we were wondering about the California Prison Guards Union, what they would do. And we figured on the one hand, you know, they were, you know, not that many people are in California prison for, I mean, sometimes people went to jail, but weren't going to state prison so much for marijuana offenses. So we wondered, and they basically stood down. And I have the feeling that one of the reasons they did, in part, apart from the fact that it did not threaten, threaten their jobs and economic well-being, is that if you're a prison guard, 
living in, you know, but fuck California, wherever it is, someplace, you know, whatever. I mean, I mean, and what do you want to do when you get home at night? You want to light up a joint, right? I mean, you know, and so I think, you know, those guards and, you know, they were being drug tested and everything. So, you know, I, I think they wanted to have the ability to be able to use this stuff legally as well. So, you know, I, I think the private prison guys, their focus was not marijuana. Although, I mean, if you look carefully, you know, our opponents always used to say, oh, almost nobody's going to state prison for marijuana possession, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, what they didn't like to point out was that when you have not just two million people behind bars total in America, but when you also have, you know, double to triple that, you know, under parole and probation supervision. And when people are getting re people on parole and probation are getting reincarcerated um, for simply failing a drug test or possessing a joint, those offenses don't get listed as a drug offense unless your original offense that led you to be under probation or parole was a drug offense. Oftentimes, if it was some other minor offense, it just shows up as a kind of shoplifting wow. or this or that. So it was a kind of hidden, you know, you know, uh, element of the drug war and of the cost of marijuana prohibition that, um, you know, it was it, nobody ever really, really kept data on this stuff. But we had lots of, you know, evidence here and there that people were being violated and sent back to state prison for basically marijuana offenses that were not being classified as such. Wow. So you could you could get arrested, put on probation for suspended license. And then, you know, you end up smoking a J, you, you test hot. I don't, I don't know if it was suspended license, but it might have been some because suspended license wouldn't quite be a misdemeanor, probably. But if you got to that next level, yeah, you could. It could be a, yeah. an offense that would not allege you to be incarcerated. And, uh, you know, where all of a sudden you are being incarcerated because you failed the drug test or what have you. I mean, look, one of the great things about, you know, I mean, now it's funny. I got to tell you, I, you know, because uh, you know, when I stopped running Drug Policy Alliance 2017, and there were, you know, dozens and dozens of reasons why I stepped down. At the time I did, I've been doing it for 23 years and all this. But I realized that I had young people coming to work for me. And they were like in elementary school, barely, when medical mar marijuana was first legalized for medical purposes in California. And they were maybe in high school or even junior high, no, high school, I guess, when, when Washington and Colorado became the first two states to legalize marijuana in 2012. And for them, it was no longer about, are we going to legalize marijuana? For them, the legalization of marijuana was kind of inevitable. It was how we're going to do it. And I was interested in that. But for me, the real... You know, when I got going in the in the late 80s on this stuff, um, first as a professor and then later in the 90s as an activist, you know, back then, you know, barely 25, 26 percent of the country wanted to legalize marijuana. And 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 I, it was barely 50 percent supporting medical marijuana, maybe even lower than that in the 80s. And, and it wasn't legal for for anything anywhere. And by the time I stepped down in 20, 2017, you know, at that point, you know, we had, what, 80 percent of the country supporting legal, legalization of marijuana. We had 55 percent supporting the, the broader legalization of marijuana. We had, I don't know, what was it back then? I can't remember. Maybe 10 states on the way to the roughly 20 it is right now that had full legalization and maybe 25 on the way to 35 or whatever it is now on medical marijuana. So that was the monumental evolution in a way that. You know, as with any major reform, it's hard for younger people to appreciate how punitive things were in the past, what it was like to live in a world with massive drug testing, with people being fired because they smoked a joint over the weekend, right? Of people, you know, of people, you know, you know, getting marijuana, you know, I mean, just all of the, the horrific things of, of people losing their jobs, losing their driver licenses, losing their property, losing their freedom because of marijuana prohibition. Right. And the stupid demonization, you know, of women testing positive for marijuana or giving birth and having their kids taken away from them by child services of people in a in a in a battle over divorce or custody. And one one parent using the other parents use of cannabis as as a reason, you know, to deprive a parent of custody, even though it had nothing to do with the quality of their parenting. Right. So, I mean, in the incredibly pernicious elements of marijuana prohibition throughout our society, even over and above the outright arrests that were going on. I mean, I think people don't appreciate, and it's, a lot of that still continues, by the way. Not all, all laws are off the books, and there's still plenty of states where things are ugly and punitive. But I mean, we have definitely come a long way, and we've advanced freedom in a major way in America, you know, by rolling back marijuana prohibition.
Now, we here at Normal, we, we do something that the other Normal pro, uh, chapters around here don't necessarily do. We actually work on writing legislation and getting it moved forward. And one of the th bills that we added to our usual compendium this year is a parent protection bill that we're working on right now. I'd love to go ahead and, and uh, get together with you later on and have you take a look at the language we're putting together so far to make certain that it's, uh, it's properly comprehensive because it is an issue that we really need to, con uh, to control that if you have a medical card, that should not be uh, the reason why your, your children should be taken away from you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Gary, I mean, part of this is the whole political process, because like when we did the first medical, when we did the first marijuana legalization initiatives and we're drafting those that succeeded, you know, we wanted to put in a whole lot of things there about total expungement of all of all previous offenses, about giving uh, advantage to people who had been you know, arrested for marijuana to be able to have a leg up and try to get some support to get into the illegal industry in terms of banning drug testing in the workplace, things like that. But we couldn't put those things in the initial initiatives because, you know, we didn't know if we were going to win or not. Right. But now, 10 years after the fact, you look at like my state, New York, where I'm very proud of my successors at Drug Policy Alliance, who played a pivotal role in taking marijuana legalization, you know, over, you know, into the you know, completing that process in New York and some of the other states where there's a lot of stuff that's taking into account the broader issues there now. And so I'm hopeful. I mean, Florida, you still got some work to do to get full legalization there. You know, I bumped into um, what's her name, Kim, um, the head of True Leave. Rivers. Big Merle, Kim Rivers. I bumped into her at the Arcview Conference in New York a few months ago. And I guess she's putting a lot of money into trying to legalize marijuana more broadly in Florida, obviously coming from a corporate perspective on this, but I think not totally insensitive to all the other considerations that should be involved. I mean, you guys got to get to the point of full legalization. Although I imagine if you can do stuff to, for example, provide parental protections and employment protections of people using uh, marijuana for medical purposes. I mean, look, any employer, of course, has the right to say that I don't want my employees, you know, being having their performance undermined by their drug use in the workplace. But ultimately, I mean, the truth is, you know, I know I had some employees you know, I didn't want them getting high before they came to work. On the other hand, I had one or two who worked just as well, if not better, when they'd smoked a joint in the morning. And so, you know, the question really is, is the quality of the work that they're doing. And drug testing is not an effective way of, 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 of addressing that issue. You know, it's not to take away from the rights of employers to say, I want my employees to be doing their job. It is to say to employers, this random drug testing bullshit where you catch people for what they did last night or over the weekend, that has no place in a modern society. Well, that's, that's, that's more of a point that Bertha Madras would, would definitely be moving forward. I mean, I know that she's been working on uh, various tests for, uh, for police to be able to, to detect just the presence of THC on Yeah, but I got to say, uh, Bertha Myers, from what I can tell her, is she is, I mean, she was a former deputy drug czar, I think, uh, can't remember if it was under Obama or Trump, but I mean, it, I mean, basically, I just do not find her a, a, a credible or honest figure in all of this sort of stuff. I mean, I mean, she, you know, I remember there was somebody in the old Bush administration, Andrea Barthwell, who became deputy drug czar, and then just did everything she could to try to undermine medical marijuana. So Bertha Madras is a more sophisticated version of somebody really trying to, you know, stand in the way of sensible drug policy, standing out against also some of the cutting edge harm reduction stuff, you know, just, you know, and using, she's at Harvard now and using that bona fide to try to get in the way. But I've seen nothing, you know, very little credible about her. I would say that. Well, you know, I just want to, I just want to highlight, you know, what, what you all are talking about, about how recent this is just this week, the Arizona Supreme court uh, ruled that the maternal use of cannabis for morning sickness doesn't constitute child neglect. Um, and that's because they declined to hear any further challenges to an appellate court ruling, which determined that child welfare officials had acted inappropriately when they put a woman on a state registry for having consumed medical cannabis while pregnant. And that court order issued uh, this past Thursday actually will remove that mother's name from appearing in that state registry, which is accessible to employers performing background checks. In mm -hmm. 2019, the Department of Child Safety took action against this lady, um, but because uh, she was medically authorized under law to consume cannabis to treat morning sickness. You know, it's not child endangerment, but her child tested positive uh, for cannabis. And this is something that I also 
um, you know, we covered a few months back, but uh, it tends to be women of color in disproportionate numbers that are being tested positive or, or being tested for cannabis in oh. hospitals. Exactly. But by the way, we should also point out, I mean, it's not just, you know, cannabis. I mean, you're very right about that. It's disproportionately poor people and people of color who get tested. It's not middle class women are getting tested. They're not they tend to be under suspicion. We also know that, you know, uh, in terms of the evidence about if a baby's born testing positive for cannabis, there's not a hell of a lot of evidence about harm associated with that. I mean, it's probably it's not going to be recommended. But if you're quite frankly somebody who needs that marijuana medically, you know, the benefits for the mother may well exceed any potential harms to a child to, in this thing. So, I, you know, it, it, it is, there's a great organization, by the way. It was called, it was, for a long time, it was called NAPW, National Advocates for Pregnant Women. And now I think it's called um, uh, Pregnancy Justice. Uh, but they've done great work in terms of representing women who were being criminalized, uh, who were being incarcerated, who were having their babies taken away from them because they'd had a miscarriage where it was automatically assumed you had a miscarriage. It must be because of the drug use, even though there'd be no evidence that it was because of the drug use. So there was incredible injustices going on this front, especially in the South, but to some extent all around the country. So no, I mean, Chad, what you're saying is it, it's crucially important that this stuff move forward. And obviously, as people get more enlightened about cannabis and to some extent about the science of other drugs as well, I think we're going to see less and less of that sort of thing happening. I'd be interested in seeing what is the differences between the uh, the agenda of the Drug Policy Alliance versus the drug policy, uh, the policy of, uh, agenda of normal. Oh, regards. well, I mean, I mean, basically on, on normal only focuses on cannabis reform. And, and, and Drug Policy Alliance, you know, for us, that was one third of our work. I mean, basically for DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, one third of our work was basically marijuana focused. And that was really four Four elements. It was, it it was first legalizing marijuana for medical purposes. Secondly, rolling back uh, the marijuana, marijuana arrests. Thirdly, you know, ending the, um, racially disproportionate, I mean, decriminal, sorry, excuse me, ending, you know, rolling back marijuana arrests and ending the racially disproportionate elements of that, because almost every place in America, you know, black and brown kids were more likely to get busted for marijuana, even though they were no more likely to have marijuana in their pocket. Thirdly, decriminalizing marijuana possession, and lastly, legally regulating it in a responsible way. So that was one third of our work, although it probably got about 70, 80 percent of the headlines. The second third of our work, was rolling back the bigger war on drugs, ending the role of war on drugs and mass incarceration. And that meant getting rid of these unjust mandatory minimum sentences for other drug, you know, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, whatever. It meant providing alternatives to incarceration. It meant these quote unquote drug free school zone laws, which are are basically just, you know, mandatory minimum drug laws with kind of better messaging associated with them. It was all of that thing. And then the last third, was making a serious commitment to treating drug use and addiction as a health issue, not a criminal issue. And that meant, you know, making it easier to obtain sterile syringes in pharmacies and needle exchange programs to reduce the spread of AIDS and hepatitis and other diseases. It meant supporting these safe injection sites that are now called overdose prevention centers. You know, now once again, to reduce overdose fatalities, it meant taking on the overdose issue by making naloxone more available, you know, the antidote for an overdose. It meant more honest and kind of sex education model to drug education. So we dealt with all of that stuff. When it came specifically to um, uh, the marijuana issue, I don't think there was much difference between us and normal. I mean, there were sometimes a few tactical differences. Like I remember, if I go back to 96 or so, I remember California normal, which is independent, you know, headed by Dale Geringer for the last 50 years or whatever. They were a key driver of the medical marijuana initiative in California. I mean, I sort of came in and raised the money and put together a professional campaign, but Dale was one of the initiators of the whole thing in building support. I think national normal was initially a little wary of the medical marijuana issue because they were among those who were worried that if you legalize marijuana first just for people who had a medical condition, that you might peel off the most sympathetic victims of marijuana prohibition and thereby undermine the momentum for broader marijuana legalization. But I think that, you know, Keith Strop and others quickly realized that that was not going to be the case. So they were very allied. I'll tell you, in 1997, I remember... We were planning to do a marijuana legalization initiative in Oregon, among six other states that I mentioned before. And Keith calls me and he says, Ethan, you know, I don't know if you saw this, which I had. 
Oregon had been the first state to decriminalize personal possession of marijuana back in the 70s. Remember in the 70s, from 73 to 77, 11 states had decriminalized marijuana possession. Oregon was the first in 73. And then what happened in 1997 was a Republican-dominated state legislature in Oregon, basically as a kind of fuck you to California having legalized medical marijuana, what they did was they recriminalized marijuana possession in the state of Oregon. Right. And 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 the Democratic governor, Kit Saber, who had been a doc, I think he was a doctor. He kind of reluctantly signed this into law. So Keith calls me and said, we got to do something. I said, well, Keith, we're already doing a medical marijuana initiative. Well, that's not going to fix this other issue. So we actually then launched a referendum to I know this is complicated, but we launched a referendum to repeal the state law you know, recriminalizing marijuana. And on election day 98, we won both. We legalized medical marijuana and we re-legalized or we re-decriminalized cannabis possession. So I would say normal has been, you know, and normal and DPA were very much allies on the substance, um, you know, throughout for all these decades. Normal more identified as the, as the organization of the marijuana consumer. And I think that was very important, whereas DPA, you know, came at this from a multidisciplinary policy and moral approach. So the consumer element was just one piece of what we did. Um, I think normal was less inhibited than we were in talking about the broader benefits of marijuana. Right. Whereas we in the earlier years kind of were more reserved about that sort of stuff. Normal, like with marijuana policy project, was focused just on marijuana reform, whereas we were, you know, you know, we'd be working in different state legislatures on both issues. Um, but I would say that um, overwhelmingly, I think we were, um, you know, very much tactically and strategically aligned, uh, aligned on this. And we found here in the state of Florida that we can't really move the cannabis policy forward and ever mention harm reduction. Because if it does, it totally negates the, 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 yeah, the first thing. And they can't think of two things at the same time. All of our bills have to have single subjects. So if we go for legalization, we can't go for legalization and home grow. Yeah, we, right. we, 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 they can only think one thing at a time because oh, Florida. I, I, I know. I know. I was talking to Kim Rivers about that, that single subject problem you have in, in Florida there. But, you know, what's good is that one of the things that, like, I had offices, not just in New York and um, D.C., but we had offices in California, New Mexico, New Jersey, and Colorado as well. Um, Drug Policy Alliance offices, and and then also supporting local organizations around the country, um, you know, sort of state-based drug policy reform organizations. But one of our strengths came from the fact that, you know, we would be working on, say, a medical marijuana legalization or uh, marijuana decrim or marijuana legalization bill, but we would simultaneously be working on a bill to roll back a mandatory minimum. Or to provide treatment instead of incarceration for people who were arrested with, you know, possession of heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. Or we'd be working on a harm reduction bill, an access to sterile syringes bill. And so what we were able to do is to build credibility. So people would sometimes look at us and they say, you guys aren't just about weed. You guys aren't just a bunch of white guys who want to legalize weed. In fact, you're working on the whole spectrum of things. And so like, for example, in California, you know, Latinos, California Latinos were initially the most resistant you know, it had majority support among whites and blacks, but less so among Latinos. And but then, you know, we spent um, a couple of years working on a crimmigration bill, a bill basically because what happened is you had people who've been living in California for many, many years, um, oftentimes as legal immigrants. And if they got one petty conviction for a drug thing, they could be deported to a country sometimes where they didn't even speak the language. They come here as babies or whatever. Right. And so we worked on those issues. And then we came back to, you know, Latino leaders, advocates, and they say, well, you helped us out on that immigration bill where we had a commonality of interest. Now we're going to work with you on the cannabis bill. Um, you know, and the same thing happened, a whole range of other issues working with, you know, when, when often some black legislators going back 10, 15 years ago were wary of the marijuana stuff. Some of them were connected to the church. They were culturally conservative, but we'd work with them on key criminal justice reform issues they cared about. And then they would basically become our allies. So so it is that even though in the state legislature, I mean, even though ballot initiative process, the single subject rule oftentimes makes it impossible to incorporate all of this together. It, at least when you're doing stuff through the state legislature, being able to work with kind of harm reduction, sentencing reform on the one hand, and then pursuing you know, um, cannabis reform on the other, I think that actually helps legitimize and build a broader base. Well, we actually are working on taking all of our bills and kind of making an omnibus bill this year. 
in the hopes that, that we, we can get some kind of consensus on that. We have employee protection, we have patient protection, so the institutions don't take away your, your, <coughs> your medicine or kick you off of the transplant list. We have reciprocity, which should have been the initial bill, and it, and it was never was. We have expansion of qualifying conditions, because we only got 10, and one of which is a, a catch-all, which, which basically the Board of Medicine can catch you and, and knock out, not take away your license at the same time. So we want to, we want to expand that. And, of course, home grow. And uh, we are just having to try to put it all together into one package, and we're hoping that this year we'll be able to get these, other, these, these things done. We've got some, some great bills we've, uh, we've uh, had filed for the last couple of years that wouldn't even get the committee. How unusual on that one, huh? Hey, Gary, where is DeSantis on all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's fighting a culture war this week uh, <laughs> on his first week in office. First thing he did is he attacked um, drag shows. Yeah, uh, he, he he wants to investigate all the universities to see how much um, yeah. uh, diversity no, I mean, I mean, uh, education is spending. I mean, on. I think DeSantis. I mean, yeah. he, the guy is a scumbag bully. I mean, I realize he's very yeah. smart. He does his research. You know, he's not just you know a kind of idiot. You know, whatever like Trump is in so many respects. I mean, with a he's got this similar kind of high skills on political intuition. But when it comes to the drug issues, I mean, even if some of these people who are terrible on a whole broad swath of cultural issues are still kind of open on some of the drug reform issues, whether we're dealing with the overdose issue, whether we're dealing with cannabis. Is DeSantis showing any kind of uh, thoughtful uh, positions on some of these other drug issues? No. He, he thinks as much about cannabis as the size of the check True Leave can write him. I That's mean, the, people are often yeah. saying, well, look, his first couple weeks in office when he first started, he went and gave us, got us whole flour for, for smoking. Or like what they call it, smokable flour. I wanted to call it whole flour, but they, but they didn't want to handle it that way. They said smokable flour. So they, they, uh -huh. they, they categorized it that way. And remarkably, the, uh, the presser that was involved in that had him standing right next to, between John Morgan and Matt Gates. So you uh, know right? where yeah. the money came from that made that policy possible. And they made it right. uh, bill number one that year. Uh, well, you know, I'll tell you, Gary, you know, also, I have to say, I mean, because on the, uh, on the one hand, you know, I, I believe that, you know, given the fact that the, that this industry, the cannabis industry, unlike every other emerging industry in American history, more or less, you know, basically, re, re, you know, was built on the on the backs and, and the work of people doing this work illegally um, for decades and decades and multi-generation families and all this stuff. So I do believe that there is a special obligation. You know, that, that as we legalize those people who got harmed by the drug war or who are going to be harmed by legalization, whether you're talking about growers, whether you're talking about people who got busted, you know, do deserve to get some leg up, some preferences. On the other hand, I also recognize that we live in the most dynamic capitalist society probably in history and that. I think the growing role of big industry, you know, people worry about the multi-state operators now as being the big guys. But once we go to federal legalization, there's nothing stopping big alcohol, big tobacco and big, big, big uh, consumer good companies from coming into this thing. So I think it's in the nature of, of any industry that we're going to see large scale consolidation happening. I don't think there's any effective way to block that over the long term. That being said, I'll say that I, the reason I think home grow is so absolutely uh, crucial, whether you're talking about cannabis or whether you're talking about mushrooms and psychedelics, is it is the way for people who do not want to participate in the whole capitalist enterprise of drug legalization to opt out. Because if you're protecting the right of people to grow their own plants or to, or to produce their own mushrooms, you know, from a mushroom kit at home, at least people can opt out. They can make their own. They can get it from a friend. You know, it's not that. I'm, I mean, I, I'm not adept at this stuff, but I'm told it's not that difficult for people who want to do it. And, you know, in the same way, maybe even easier. I mean, you know, look, you know, there's no when, when I see people in the industry who want to oppose home grow. I mean, a pox on their houses. I mean, it is contemptible, the level of greed. I mean, you don't have Anheuser-Busch, to my knowledge, opposing people have, making their own beer at home, right? Or have the big whiskey companies opposing the fact that somebody might produce a little stuff in their, you know, a little backyard uh, experimentation if they're not marketing this stuff. So I think that the real opt out for those people who don't want to participate in this broader capitalist system is home grow. And I think it's morally incumbent upon any of the major players in this to be supporting home grow as much as possible. I realize that may be a problem with your single subject rule in Florida, but there's got to be a, a real commitment to making sure that happens.
I mean, it's also true that when you actually, like I, I remember in Washington State, you know, one of the first two states to legal marijuana back in 2012, 10 years ago, that I was upset that they did not have home grow, protection of home grow in there. But I nonetheless put a million and a half bucks of the money I'd raised into that campaign because when you look carefully, you realize that it was highly unlikely the cops were going to go after small scale home grow even if it was not technically legal, once you had legalized marijuana more broadly. That if people were growing their own at home in a small amount, it was the lowest priority for cops once marijuana was more broadly legalized, as long as you weren't out there selling it in any significant amount. And so I think as long as we can get home grow in every state that legalizes, I think um, it's going to provide a safety valve for those people who have legitimate concerns about you know, the, the inevitable role of big capital in a legal marijuana industry. I mean, the history of home grow here in Florida is interesting because we did have that medical necessity rule that we we, we got started with with uh, thanks to Mr. Kent and all that bit back in in the in the nineties eighties and nineties. It allowed people to have home grow provided they could show there was a medical need for it, and in some cases it worked because it was a defense. It was not necessarily something that you could automatically get. And we're we're trying to start now something now because as I saw in the legislation in, in uh, Tallahassee, what they're their main, their main concern is they're still stuck in the coal memo. They're looking for robust regulation, and they are afraid of not being able to regulate home grow. And they're absolutely certain that if anybody has home grow, they'll be passing out samples to the kids walking home from school uh, <laughs> or, or, yeah. or growing it on their front lawn and saying, yeah, I, oh, I, it's, it's, sample. I know. I, but, but look, I mean, I also know that when we first started doing public opinion polling and research back around 97 on the legalization issue, I remember we did a um, uh, a focus group in Greeley, Colorado of, I think, middle aged white Republican men. Right. Most of whom were inclined against legalization. But it's where we first came up with the phrase tax control, regulate and educate. And what we realized was that these guys could come around to supporting legalization if you didn't call it legalization. Um, if you didn't say legalize, but when you talked about the fact that you could be taxing somebody else's vice, quote unquote, cannabis in order to pay taxes that you didn't want to be paying. And then when if you use the words control and regulate, which were basically synonymous, but it meant that they saw that if legalization, if they understood it to be legal regulation with tight control, they could support it. And then, of course, add in education, because that's kind of incumbent to always talk about educating young people, blah, 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 forever that's worth and hopefully something. Right. But so so there was a reason those early days when the home growth thing was problematic. In fact, I remember the first medical marijuana initiative we did in California. No, we didn't draft it. It was drafted by Dennis Barone and other activists and Dale Geringer at California Normal, those guys. And it included home grow in it. And when we polled on it, we saw that most of the provisions of the medical marijuana initiative back in 96 were popular with the public, got majority of support. But the home growth thing got under 50 percent support. And I was initially reluctant to jump in because I was persuaded that the opposition would drive a Mack truck through the home grow provision and we end up losing because of that. And fortunately, there was enough support in the final analysis for the broader legalization of medical marijuana that the home grow thing did not undermine our potential victory. But we worried about it for a long time. Now, of course, we have 25, 27 years under a belt. There's no evidence that home grow has turned out to be a problem from a law enforcement perspective, from an adolescent marijuana use perspective or anything. So the arguments against it now just don't I mean, they, they never carried a, had a lot of merit to them. But even now, it, it's kind of ridiculous. So I think the more you can do to fight to get that in there and through. Um, uh, I think is absolutely pivotal. But Gary, listen, I should say, I see it's noon now, so I'm going to need to go in, in a moment here. But I've really enjoyed talking with you guys. I really admire the work you're doing in, in Florida and trying to fight the good fight in a very politically complicated state with a, you know, uh, well, I won't say anything more as a New Yorker. I don't want to sound... Uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. You, you, we, 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 have we, we, we have our own issues up here. And, and you know, we have the embarrassment of having... Uh, you know, you know, I mean, DeSantis, if New York could have gerrymandered, you know, our districts the way DeSantis did in Florida, we'd be swearing in Hakeem Jeffries in the in the in the Congress today. So, you know, my state, not my not not Manhattan, but, uh, you know, my state bears responsibility for some of uh, what's happened politically, I'm sad to say. And George you know. Santos, I'm afraid. 
Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, listen, best of luck to you guys. And thank you, uh, thank you so much for having me on. You are and, welcome uh, to join us anytime in the future. We really enjoyed having you well, on. I appreciate it. And listen, both just to put in a pitch, you know, my pot, my podcast is called psychoactive. It's on all the channels. It's uh, unfortunately it's not been renewed for third season. So that even though I've had a growing audience and great reviews, the numbers were simply weren't big enough to, uh, justify it for iHeart and the other major backers, but hopefully I'll get it there in, a, in another form and it's going to remain up there. And there's a lot of episodes about cannabis stuff and even more, I think about psychedelic stuff. So I think people, uh, you know, please check it out and spread the word. Okay. Hey, thank thanks you for joining much. us in the rotation. We appreciate okay, it. Take, take and we got to have you back. Absolutely. Okay. My pleasure. I'll do it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Now, guys, I, I have to put out a, a quick call here because we're oh, doing this. I'm, I'm doing this next little speech here on behalf, on behalf of the, the guy to my right, your left, uh, Carlos. He has on his bucket list, he wants to have a, a joint with Willie Nelson. <laughs> now, this is, this is his bucket list, and you're going to ask me, is Carlos dying? No, he has, a, he has a very, very long bucket list, and he wants to get started on it early. And so... We now know that Willie Nelson will be one of the headlines at the Strawberry Festival this year. Yeah. While everybody is sitting there walking around with their Delta 8 joints and, <laughs> and, and, and wharfing down strawberry shortcakes, they are also checking out Willie Nelson. And Willie, if you want to come to, to, to Chillum and, and have a joint with Carlos, we're all for that. If you want to do it virtually in your dressing room or in your, in your van, you know, the smoke-filled van you guys usually drive around, that's okay, too. Let's help Carlos with this. Yeah, we so we gotta figure that out because uh, Will Will he's like on the board for normal. He's like an, a celebrity board member or some shit. So if you have any and connection with Willie, uh, whoever has any connection with the Strawberry Festival or anything, yeah. if you could get us in there, like let us know. Well, we have connections with the uh, the, the Plant City Democratic Party, the East Hillsboro folks, and so we'll we'll, we'll see if we can uh, find some way to get into the uh, plant the, the uh, Strawberry Festival that way. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some uh, uh, news I wanted to share with our listeners. Um, one in particular is a recent analysis that has come out of the Department of Homeland Security. Turns out that uh, uh, federal uh, marijuana seizures at the border are down uh, almost 50 percent uh, from 21, uh, 2021 totals. And that continues to drop dramatically. Uh, if you think think about it, this past year, they confiscated an estimated 155,000 pounds of marijuana at the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a 50% drop from the previous year. But if you look at 2013, they have seized nearly 3 million pounds of cannabis confiscated at the southern border. So what does this mean? It means that legalization here in America is taken away from the marijuana profits of the Mexican drug cartels. It means that legalization is a good thing. It means that if you care about <laughs> these major issues of immigration, if you care about border security, you should be someone who is pro-legalization. Now, I have a, a, a in my cadre of, of possible speakers, a gentleman who, who does a lot of law in Mexico in regards to their legalization. I think that Mexico's legalization is also having a part in that as well. Although uh, DeSantis, I, I admit he... Uh, I guess his big push now is uh, xenophobia, and we have to make certain that there's no more people coming across the border because, God forbid, anybody seeks asylum yeah. in Florida. I mean, I mean that, that is so much so that you have to call the National Guard on a bunch of Cubans. Exactly that. Or, and, and then ship them to uh, uh, the vice president's house when it's 18 degrees out and that kind of stuff, like the guy <laughs> did in, in Texas. We, I mean, xenophobia is not pretty, but they make it. Uh, palatable for their for their base so let so be it we'll, we'll, we'll end up having to fight that too but we, we, we need to discuss that as well well you know let, let, let's talk about you know because people are often accuse us of being uh, uh liberally biased okay and i just want to give props to republican governor mike dewine from ohio he recently signed some comprehensive sentencing reform uh in the law and that the arrest or conviction for possession of marijuana paraphernalia no longer qualifies as a part of a person's criminal record and doesn't need to be disclosed in a response to any inquiries about your criminal record. Um, you know, so often here in Florida, if someone get arrested for possession, they'll get a secondary uh, 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 charge for paraphernalia. And other provisions in that law uh, 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 create a pathway so misdemeanor marijuana convictions can now petition the court to have their record sealed within one year. And the legislation also amends state law so first-time 
uh, offenses um, by uh, minors can be vacated and expunged uh, at the local level by local county prosecutors. So, I mean, you know, I just want to give a props to Republicans doing good things when it comes to reform. And and the the, uh, the Republicans are also not uh, have sole discretion in regards to bad policy either, because Gretchen Whitmer this last week vetoed three cannabis bills that came to the legislature, and two of which I don't didn't mind because basically one was saying you, you couldn't investigate the spouse of somebody applying for a license, and then mm-hmm. and then the second that said that anybody who is married to a uh, person who is involved in the government can still get a license. So I think you put those two together and you can pretty much figure out exactly what those two bills were all about. Making sure that somebody who is married to somebody who wants to get a license can and, and you know, that kind of whole situation becomes a little, little bit less sticky for them, although it is ethically impure. But the, uh, the third bill had to do with access. And I, and I think that by lumping those three together, that was a bad move on her part. Gary, what about people who want to get a license in a certain state who husbands have been arrested for bribing elected officials around licensing? I mean, that's <laughs> that's an interesting law to, to try to adopt. I mean, I'm just saying, just saying, if we're going to be having all these laws around right. licensing and you want to investigate people's spouses, let's I, do something that matters. I, I in Illinois, say, we had people who had lost who lost their position in the government because of the fact that they had used their power, their their insider influence to get to get licenses in Illinois. I'm just frustrated, guys. I can't. I can't take it anymore. This is like ridiculous at this point. I, I, you know, I, I gotta say, Kano, like we're we're we've been accused of being, uh, you know, pro liberal or and conservative haters or whatever you want to call it. But I'm there. I'm I'm registering as a Democrat. I I am sick and tired of this shit. I like it. I am not looking forward to lobby days. We got lobby days coming up. Um. In the next month, oh, do do tell, and uh, we're we're going to, you know, we I I, I did we lock down a date? I, I don't remember. We're, we're in the process of, of yeah, but we're gonna do. Uh, I'm we, glad you mentioned that. We're we're gonna do we, some working lobby days, so it'll be yeah. more of if you want to put into work, join us. We're gonna have a general lobby days more in March where you can come. Well, well I, I think we have figured out the date with Melissa. I just don't think we've 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 announced it or anything like that. You guys but, gotta focus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the 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 thing is is that essentially next month i think it's like february 20th or some shit like that we're going we're going to be up in the the capital and we're going to be doing what we should be doing and lobbying for marijuana reform and we do this just about every time session comes into play and uh you know it's honestly a pretty cool experience you know you get to meet your the people that are on your side you get to talk to the people that are against you or at least their aides and you know what i mean like you and you you get to you get to experience uh having your voice heard and that means i guess also we wanted to contact the new Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, which apparently is not the same yeah. as the last Department of Agriculture and not, Consumer Services. Not at all. If you, if you look for site, why, if you check out the uh, the hemp section, you will find uh, nothing. That's why I'm not looking forward to going up there because I don't think we're going to have any friends. I think it, it's officially done. Like we're 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 screwed here. Um, that is how we make this is. Uh, well, you know, maybe we'll make some friends, Gary. Uh, maybe you will, but like, I, I, I am frustrated of working to for some sort of progress and being having a conservative in the way, telling me that I can't have it because God doesn't want it, or because of the kids, or because of, of something irrational, or God's kids, or God's kids, Jesus. <laughs> I believe that's Jesus. <laughs> Oh, we only, only had one kid. I, I didn't know that, that God was into the one child policy. God, God only had one son. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the creed, Gary. His only begotten son. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're Does Jewish. that mean that the Holy Ghost is actually God's wife? That that's God's that's because cousin. that's bestiality. That's I don't think God's I can go with that. nephew, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. No, it, it's we'll it's fucking news frustrating, problem. guys. And I think yeah. I think it's time that you know, honestly, uh, up to now, we've been trying to be inclusive. We've been trying to to, and I think it's time that we fucking call out a war because. They're not getting it. They're not giving on on anything. They're not. They're not going. As a matter of fact, this year we're probably going to see some hemp bills come out that are going to try to make what we do here at Chillum illegal. Now, I freaked you out last year by walking up the Spencer Road and having a, having a nice conversation, and you 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 started sweating on me. I I walked away. I was like, oh, this guy. <laughs> this well, you guy know, it's, I want my it's, shit. 
in my time when I when I uh, interned and worked in the legislature, uh, my mentor told me you have two options: you can try and work across the aisle to actually get something done for the people, or you can sit in the back and lob grenades. And considering the Republicans now have a supermajority in both houses, uh, Carlos isn't necessarily wrong in feeling disillusioned and disheartened, and, and he's ready to fucking pull the pin and just start launching grenades because uh, it, it does feel like there is no light, there is no wiggle room in this because you have the same people who are in charge that will sit up there and tell you to your face that weed is bad, but you know until their kid gets popped or kicked out of college, now you know then it becomes an issue. And, and so, you know, that's something that just continues to drive me crazy. Um, but I will say this, you know, uh, we were giving props earlier to Republican governor from Ohio. I want to take the time to give props to the Democratic governor from um, Connecticut. They have expunged for uh, 42,964 cannabis convictions, erased it as of January 1st in the state of Connecticut. So props and that's 2000 to governor. Connecticut too. Yeah, props to Democratic Governor Ned Lamont uh, for, for you know, supporting that and, and making that happen in Connecticut. But, you know, in, in Maryland, uh, as of uh, the, the first of the year, uh, 2.5 ounces of cannabis is no longer subject to criminal penalties. It's actually a, a $250 fine. And um, come July of this year, 1.5 ounces of cannabis or less uh, will have no penalty at all. And people will be allowed to grow two plants at home in the state of Maryland. So uh, props to, you know, the Maryland legislature for putting that on the ballot. Props to the voters for passing it. I'm pretty excited to see them uh, do some big things in Maryland in, in regards to a robust uh, adult use market. Okay. And with that, I think that we need to uh, wind up this. Uh, <coughs> I agree. We've gone too far. We, we, we need to go home and take communion. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Carlos, you got that uh, that link uh, you can flash on the screen for our YouTube channel. You know, one thing in the new year, uh, we we yes, still broad yeah. we still broadcast on Facebook, we still broadcast on Twitch, but we also broadcast on YouTube. And you can uh, follow our YouTube channel. Um, you can visit us in the the link. <laughs> It looks like you clicked on the link <laughs> rather than flashing the link. But it is uh, YouTube.com uh, slash the at symbol Suncoast Normal. So if you just go to YouTube.com uh, slash at Suncoast Normal, you can access our amazing library, including today's live uh, features and all the past ones that we've had, uh, our different content. And uh, give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Uh, you know, again, if you want to support, you can also join our Patreon uh, if you want to flash the link to our Patreon and continue to, to promote and support. Um, you know, we're trying to make it happen here uh, at Suncoast Normal. As it was said before, we want the independents to speak the truth, and that requires us to have the funding from you, the people, rather than funding from these large corporations and multi-state cannabis operators. So if you want to be a part of, of supporting what we're doing and being a part of this independent, uh, truthful news, then you, you need to continue to support what we're doing here at The Rotation. And we are at a spot right now where we have to educate to legislate. So we're paying it forward right here, giving you the information that you need to go ahead and make a change in your legislators' opinions. Those who believe in facts, give it to them. That's absolutely true. That's it. Bye, guys. And with that, 